Good evening, everybody. How are you? This is Enrique uh, of Spanish United. Uh, today we have a very special guest on the show. Uh, would you be kind enough to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, good evening. My name is Allison Henry, and I'm the co-founder of the San Gabriel Valley Tenants Alliance. Awesome. It's a pleasure to have you on the, sh on the show, Allison. Thank you, Enrique. Really looking forward to talking with you. Likewise, as we had spoken on, on uh, emails and text, um, I am part of the uh, tenants rights group here in Glendale because I live here in Glendale. And as you know, uh, one of the biggest issues that we have in our state is um, ho housing affordability and, and the issue of homelessness. And I believe they both go together. As you know, uh, we have a homelessness crisis in our state. And a lot of it has to do because, you know, there is no rent control and uh, a lot of uh, corrupt, greedy landlords uh, decide to raise the rent to astronomical levels that people cannot afford and people become displaced. And uh, there's been a, a very big battle between um, tenants rights advocates groups versus uh, corporate uh, landlords. And uh, the ones that are really being, being affected by um, by eviction are Hispanic people because they are the least economically and politically viable, you know, people in the state when it comes to uh, when it comes to housing rights and the most vulnerable because many of them are not aware of the laws or their rights. So a lot of um, um, landlords that that are cruel they prey on them and, and they abuse them more. So I would like to know as far as what you do. Um, what can what can be done in terms of tenants rights for you know for the people well <clears throat> first of all i'm i'm you know very glad to hear you that you've made the connection between homelessness and rising housing costs because that alone enrique like some of what we do as advocates and organizers um, is just educating people who might may be a little bit wealthier than us or a little bit older than us and had a different economic journey than the ones that um, younger people are having and really drawing that line between um, homelessness and rising housing costs is really important because for a long time the narrative about you know people on the street or living in their cars was they were drug addicts they were alcoholics they had mental health issues <clears throat> and while some of those things may be true as a result of living on the streets, um, more and more of the data uh, points to uh, conclusively that you know first time um, or or in first for some folks even second time homelessness is directly related to um, you know a rent increase they couldn't um, absorb uh, loss of a job right we we're looking now in the context of COVID nineteen. Um, any other type of personal emergency that can compromise one's finances in a way where you don't get your rent paid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with how expensive apartments are, once you're out of an apartment, it is really hard to get back in. Mm -hmm. um, and you've mentioned the corporate landlords and, you know, it's, it's a real poison in the whole system, this um, corporatization of housing, but really like the aggressive business practices that you see in corporations. They have really moved the Overton window for practices between landlords and tenants um, so that we have these really high housing costs, that we have aggressive eviction machines. And it really does differ from maybe renting um, from a, a family, you know, 20 or 30 years ago where you knew your landlord. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you were both in it together. It was supposed to be more of a symbiotic relationship. And for a lot of people who have had their housing for a long time, and I mean homeowners, condo owners, even if they consider themselves progressive or leftist, they don't realize until they're educated that, you know, housing is really the flashpoint for a lot of people being able to literally live or die, uh, for people to be able to um, have autonomy. Uh, for people to be able to seek the best jobs possible um, and, you know, any kind of environmental initiatives, right? Because you and I both know, I mean, you're in Glendale, I'm in Pasadena. Um, we both know that a significant amount of traffic that you see on the 210 freeway, the 10 freeways, all because of housing costs. Right. You know, people right. can't 
live close to work. So, I mean, we're really looking at a context where, you know, we have a state cap <clears throat> on uh, rent increases, but it's still pretty high. It depends on what county you're in. And I think the bigger question to ask around things like, you know, rent control specifically, you know, when we're talking about rent control, we're talking about fixed rate housing costs. And it's interesting if you've bought a house or, you know, in the, in the process of, of buying your house from the bank over 20 or 30 years, which is what a mortgage is, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a way you're kind of renting it from the bank until you own it, you know, all of those policies are managed at a much different governmental level than landlord tenant rent costs. All of that, particularly here in California, has been, I think, unfairly pushed out of the hands of the state, out of the hands of the federal government towards local city government, which tends to be full of real estate interests that want to keep housing prices high right. to the detriment of sometimes, right? They're a tenant majority city. Right. You know? and, so and, that's, kind of, and, that, yeah. and that is a major problem because a lot of... Uh, conservatives and right-wing people always like to say all oh, because of taxes and it's nothing has nothing to do with taxes it's like what you said it has to do because when you keep uh, the housing and um, the fixed rate out of out of the federal government and you, and you give it into the hands of private people it creates a lot of disaster and what's happening is that a lot of people that for example that work in the city they have to commute maybe one or two hours to go back home because you know they can't live where they work. And what I, how I see it is that um, it becomes unsustainable where people work in a city that they can't afford to live and they have to travel one or two hours just to get home. And then they're not uh, making a living wage to even to keep up with the cost of gas because cut gas is, is expensive. So I, I really believe that you know, one, one of the things that I would like to see done is that there needs to be a complete stop on building uh, luxury apartments. We need to uh, kick out the corporate landlords and uh, give more control to the um, to people that own homes or may own like, like a four or five, six unit, which is not that big, and give like an incentive to these landlords, you know, for people that are low income, like for example, uh, where the where the federal government gives them like an incentive where they will cover like maybe like 60 or 70 percent of, of the cost and then the tenant pays the 30 40 percent let's say for example the state covers a low-income tenant let's say the uh, the rent is 500 and the uh, and the uh, and the government covers like you know, like a quarter of that, and then the rest is paid by the tenant. So that something that becomes more valuable. I mean, that becomes more valuable. At the same time, um, it will keep people friending up on 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 the street because it's like uh, this. This cannot continue. Where you know, landlords that are corporate are just you know taking over everything, pushing the little landlords out that have like a home or have like a. Um, uh, like a few units, and then they just want to raise everything to the point that people can't afford it. And, and I believe that that could create a lot of uh, instability uh, socially and in, in the in the long run, which but you know we haven't seen it here in our state like we've seen like in Portland and Chicago when it comes to like housing and other things. So I believe that if, if we get rid of the uh, the luxury um, housing, the luxury uh, uh, corporations, you know, all these uh, corporate landlords that just want to push, you know, for, you know, luxury, everything that will definitely stabilize the prices at the same time, give more incentives towards the people. Because I feel that if the people have more incentives, that will, you know, make a compromise between the tenants and the landlords. And that way the landlords don't have to be raising the price just to, just to, uh, to survive. Maybe, right? I mean, incentives are, you know, I, in, in economic terms, the word incentive is a very interesting word to me because, you know, I think we've seen this in our, you know, with human relationships, in our human um, ecosystem, if you will, sometimes what you, what you think would be or should be a good incentive still doesn't work. 
right? Um, I think about the Section 8 program. So you were uh, mentioning, you know, um, the state helping low-income tenants. Well, we, we actually have something like that in the form of Section 8. And Section 8 has um, some people have a negative connotation of it, quite frankly, because of racism, because right. in their mind, right? Um, because they, in their mind, they're, they, they're conjuring up someone else's bias around particularly African-American um, tenants. Hispanic but, tenants. You know, and Hispanic tenants and this idea that poor people don't work, which is just bias and, and, and lies, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Section 8 program is a really interesting situation where you have, you have guaranteed income, okay? Think of it this way, like you're a landlord and you're, you, go, you go, okay, well, I'm going to take a Section 8 tenant. So you've got guaranteed income from the federal government and the state and the various programs that contribute to the, what we call a Section 8 program. You know, the tenant's been vetted. Um, and in fact, a Section 8 tenant has um, more like, there are more rules for a Section 8 tenant than there are for a tenant paying his or her own 100% of his or her own rent. And I'll give you an example, mm -hmm. um, very infamous example, actually. So um, if you're a Section 8 tenant, um, and let's say your grandma and your grandson comes out of prison um, and stays with you and has some sort of issue, probably a minor issue, perhaps even a non-issue, either with local law enforcement or even management, not only can your grandson get thrown out of your apartment um, and he's just come out of prison, so that's going to be a real difficult journey for your grandson, but because of Section 8 rules, you can be thrown out. And that's actually a big criticism of, of that particular program. But what's disheartening about Section 8 is there are tenants who get those vouchers, Enrique, and they try and try and try to find a landlord who will take them. And the Section 8 voucher doesn't cover enough of the rent because the rent is too damn high. And so you have this phenomenon of a gov you know, of basically a program that we've all ultimately contributed to in the form of various taxes that we pay, income tax or state tax or you know, sales tax. You know, we've got this program that can't be utilized because people get these vouchers that they can't use. And what's interesting in the Section 8 program, when you talk with people in the area who administer that program and work with tenants trying to get housing using a section eight voucher, it's not like they're walking around with a voucher for like 600 bucks. They've mm -hmm. actually, you know, the, the HUD recognizes not fully, but it recognizes the high housing costs in LA County and has given, if you will, a, a little bit of a boost to the HUD vouchers. And yet tenants struggle so much so that they have to, you know, they, they're able to, like when you get your voucher, you have like I think it's like two or three months and then it expires. But because it's such a struggle to find affordable housing, you know, it's not uncommon for tenants to be, have vouchers for up to six months. And some of them, like uh, like 30% of the vouchers ultimately go unused. But they, you know, after six months or nine months, I know some tenants have had it extended to nine months. You know, at, at some point HUD has to say, look, you know, we got to pull this back and give it to somebody else, maybe who can use, use it in Lancaster or Pomona, you know, but that's, that's the situation even with subsidized housing. And when you were talking about like the luxury housing, I'm glad that you raised that because the luxury housing is another example of like, there was more luxury housing built than needed. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> right. Someone didn't do their homework, if you will. Um, and also it's like just good for everyone to know in the housing scheme of things, you know, as we get closer to the Olympics being in Los Angeles, luxury housing is going to be one of those things where, you know, um, it can be used as a short term rental for someone to make a ton of money. And when I think about the cities around the world whose housing markets were really impacted by luxury housing in the Olympics, you know, I'm thinking of um, Vancouver, Canada, I'm thinking London. Um, you know, uh, Brazil, I mean, there, there are a lot of countries where there's a lot of lessons we can draw from that. And yeah, keeping an eye on luxury housing, stopping that entirely. Every city right now is vis revisiting its housing element. And this is another place where you can have constant pressure to reduce the number of luxury units that mm -hmm. are in these housing elements. We can try and get more in line with, you know, um, the incomes of the city. And, you know, What's interesting, Enrique, in two air, in two cities here in the SGV, Monrovia and um, Pasadena, 
this, <laughs> those cities have wound up, if you will, subsidizing luxury housing developments that lay vacant. Mm-hmm. And so here in Pasadena, it's, you know, it's ultimately a win, but, you know, it's one of these things where the Theo at, um, I think it's El Molino and the 210 freeway, when it was redeveloped and, and built, um, it was luxury housing that we did not need. And guess what? It lay vacant. And a lot of these places are not transparent with their vacancies, but it lay vacant um, long enough that now the, that building and owner is in talks with the city of Pasadena and the school district to do what's called missing middle housing, mm-hmm. housing for teachers and administrators who maybe make too much um, to qualify for something like section eight, but definitely will never be able to afford purchasing right. their own home. Right? Yeah, like so one, yeah, like, like one wow, example. What, what's going on with that, right? Yeah, like one example would be also like in the Chinese uh, enclaves of San Gabriel, like Arcadia, Temple City, Monterey Park, San Marino, Alhambra, the city of San Gabriel. That's also becoming a big issue, like primarily like in, in Arcadia. Every time I go there, it's like what I see is that the Chinese are building more and more mansions and that's causing the price of everything to go up so you know there needs there needs to be a cap not just in luxury housing but also on the, you know you know how many how many uh luxury um, homes could be built because it's like it's causing even people that have owned their home not to be in their home because taxes have, have gone up so it's like there needs there needs to be like some type of a penalty to the developers that they just uh, prey on on neighborhoods and communities, you know, to try to get them to leave. So that way they could tore down those neighborhoods and make them into gated communities or luxury communities. Like I'm seeing that a lot, like in many Hispanic areas that are becoming uh, gentrified, that uh, you have high income tenant, high income residents that move in, everything goes up and a lot of people have to leave. So that's causing a demographic change like i'm seeing that like a lot like in east l.a where you see a lot of the chinese that are coming from a monterey park and they're moving into parts of east l.a and gentrifying it so it's like you know where do we draw draw the line because it's because it's it's affecting uh a lot of the people that you know it's getting to a point that you know they can't even you know even afford to rent a room I mean, it's interesting to see the different wealth categories of incoming money, right, uh, to the United States. And then, like, because I think about in the San Gabriel Valley, we have, a, like, several bands of, um, you know, Asian um, immigrants or, you know, Asian Americans, right? We've got loads of people who came over in the 60s and 70s who still struggle, Right. And then we've got like more recent immigrants who are coming and buying very large homes. I encountered this on like the advocates end, Enrique, last year when Project Room Key was happening in a lot of the San Gabriel uh, Valley cities where, you know, vacant hotels were being used to um, house unsheltered folks so that COVID wouldn't spread. And what's interesting is there was some pushback from people in cities saying it would bring crime, right. uh, you know, all this kind of like racist, xenophobic stuff. What was so stupid about it was, you know, these hotels that lay vacant, all of them pay something called a transit occupancy tax, which means a tax to their city or local government. It's like a tourist tax, right? And so all these NIMBYs, these racist NIMBYs, classist NIMBYs were willing to forego that tax money for their community community to mm-hmm. keep these hotel rooms vacant right but what, what really startled me was in two communities in particular um, the call-ins and the people voicing their um, their fear of of and they would actually mention a lot like um, african-american you know black homeless folks they would mention them like by race you know these callers a lot of them were recent immigrants from china right. but they were very very wealthy Mm-hmm. And, and it was, in, it was so, it was striking. I'm, I'm a child of immigrants. I'm the first citizen in my family. My parents and older sister are green card holders. And, and it just struck me as, as someone with that experience and just, and, and knowing what was happening with just housing costs in general, it just struck me, Enrique, to hear someone with, with a non-local accent talk about how these 
homeless people in their community weren't from their community. Right. And how and they just need to be shipped out to the and desert. And, <laughs> right. And what's interesting is oh. that they don't realize that con- that contributes to anti-Asian sentiment. Because it's like, you know, I'm not saying that it's right, but, you know, when you have local people that have been here all their lives and then you have foreigners that are wealthy that come here and, and, and adopt a lot of the racist and homophobic attitudes as the wasp, you know, you can't you can't expect people to to like you, you know, when they when they have that me- mentality, because a lot of those wealthy people are actually exploiting the local people here. It's like I've seen it a lot, you know, in many Hispanic communities that get exploited by wealthier immigrants that just because they have money that, that they think they have the right to dictate to others. Yeah, wealth definitely, um, you know, skews one's perspective on uh, equitable human relations, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then you throw a a race or ethnic factor in there as well. Um, It's like a storm that can build on itself. Um, And it's, it's horrible. Yeah, I think about the and it's also just, it's, it speaks to like, what, how do people get here too? You know, I, I, I often think about that, like, you know, what does it mean to come over on a plane? What does it mean to come over um, hidden somewhere? What does it mean to come over that you could possibly die on the way over? I just think about the various journeys and what does that, and what does that mean coming into a country with a lot of, I mean, America has a lot of baggage, right? Exactly. Um, we, a lot of <laughs> economic and racial baggage. Um, yikes, <laughs> you know, land of opportunity for a lot of therapy, but yeah, I, I sort of joke, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's when the melting pot isn't melting the way you want it. The people seem to be burned by the melting pot. Right. Right. And I feel that Hispanics are being burned by it the most, but unfortunately they don't, they, they don't have any voice because you don't really hear about it. So like what I'm doing with my organization, my foundation is to give the voice to these to Hispanics that feel that they have been left out by the by the economy because a lot of Hispanics do contribute to the economy but they don't reap the benefits and I feel that they're the ones that are struggling the most because a lot of them are not citizens a lot of them don't speak English so you know they're even treated by others you know that are even minorities that are immer- that are American born as you know that Hispanics are seen as 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 foreigners. So I feel that it's very important that, um, you know, there are better relations with uh, all groups, but what's most important is that um, there, there needs to be um, a sustainable, pragmatic and compromise when it comes to, you know, sorry about that. <laughs> when it, when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, you know housing and rent control, because this this cannot continue. Because I feel that if this is if this doesn't uh, uh, become stabilized, there there can be there can be there can be riots and uprisings. You know where you have tenants killing landlords or burning the homes of landlords because you know they're being evicted and they get nowhere to go and then they just lash out. Because that's happening. Yeah, and- Yes. And, and actually, I would say that, um, you know, that's like a, a very violent extreme. Um, and I hope we don't get there. Like, like what you've said, I hope we don't get there. And I'm, sometimes I wonder that, like, how many people, how many people on the street will it take so that we're not talking about organizing tenants anymore? We're talking about organizing the homeless army, um, you know, but I think there are lots of places where we do see what I would call a system failure. Um, of, of the high cost of housing, right? You know, people working two or three jobs, um, you know, more people applying for food programs because the rent eats first. Um, disarray in some of the school districts. Um, either they, uh, I know for Pasadena, the struggle is keeping kids in the district, but for a lot of other districts in the San Gabriel Valley, some of it is being able to keep teachers and janitors and bus drivers and all of the non-certificated um, staff in a school. Um, you know, how do you keep people in your city when the landlords are charging more than what your school district can pay? Right, and I and I believe there should be laws that that penalize uh, landlords for uh, raising the rent. You know, just to just to make a profit. You know, I think there needs to be very stiff. Uh, penalties so that way it, it'll serve as a deterrent you know so that way landlords won't just you know be predatory and and uh, try to evict people uh, as as an excuse to make a make a profit 
Yeah, and it's I found myself thinking about like what are the various policy mechanisms to because we want to do two things, right? Like if we think about like particularly Hispanics and um, and people on you know low wage hourly jobs that are seen by their employers as disposable, right? Because that that means that you don't that your work sustainability is difficult, which means your ability to um, you know have housing is is up in the air, which is everything. But mm -hmm. I found myself in making like rent control is a really good, um, you know, policy, right? Because it limits rent increases and in how often um, we would need to include something um, in, in local laws. And that would, it would, it would need to be a change at the state level, but something called vacancy decontrol. I'm, I'm sure maybe you've heard of it, but it's the idea that when one, one, where one tenant moves out, the rent on the apartment can't go up. Exactly. Right. Because, right. Because, you know, that's it's interesting to me to think about, like, how are the rents increasing? And part of like it's kind of a two edged sword for landlords, like when things are good and the economy is booming, they can they can charge a lot for rent. But you know what? When things are bad because we have a housing crisis, um, they can they can charge ever increasing rents. You know, I haven't heard of anyone's rent going down during right. this whole time. Right. Yes. So I thought about this. So, so like, so you've got rent control that would limit the rent increases, but really in my mind, I, I mean, this is anathema to much of our, you know, property culture in California, but I would love to see the actual value of property driven down. Right. And I've like thought about like, what are the mechanisms for that? So I would love to see a tax system where the tax is based on what your rent is. And the more you charge a tenant in rent, the more tax you've got to pay. So if you rent an apartment at $800, you don't have any, you know, as a landlord, for example, you know, we're, we're dreaming in color for a moment. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if, if as a landlord, you're renting a, a one bedroom apartment for $800, you wouldn't pay this tax. But if you right. rent this one bedroom apartment at 1500, you're going to pay like 85% tax right. on that. You know, it was, it's a model that's actually used on alcohol um, mm. in different parts of the world, um, particularly whiskey is what I'm thinking of, but it's this mm. idea that it's kind of a deterrence tax is, is right. kind of what it is, right. you know, but you, you know, and, and that's what we're talking, right? Because like you said, it's the whole, the fact that housing is a business, a very poorly regulated business, and one that um, can really disproportionately affect you know, uh, groups, Hispanics, um, women, low income, you know, single parents, seniors, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't own your home and you're at the um, mercy of the property market, you know, and you're not able to work anymore. Mm -hmm. That is very right? true. Well, um, here comes the, uh, the end of our podcast because I have another podcast coming on, but I wanted to thank you so much, Allison, for uh, coming on the show. I truly appreciate it. Uh, when I'm done, I will send you the link. I'll, is it okay that I, I could share it to the attendance group? Please. And I'll also send, send the link to, uh, to Shiraz. Great. And, you know, I would just say to folks like join your tenants groups and all that. But yeah, I appreciate this. And I hope it's more conversations because Santa Ana, you know, I meant to say like Santa Ana um, just got rent control. Oh, awesome. Yes, I remember hearing that. Well, yeah, thank you so, thank you so deal, much. You know? Thank you so much, Austin, for being on the show. And we'll definitely keep in touch. Thank you, Enrique, and have a, a great rest of your podcast. Thanks for, thanks for all the work you do. You too. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.